Funding for lawmakers comes from the University of West Georgia in Carrollton, ensuring a better life for Georgians in the 21st century. More than 100 programs of study prepare students for successful careers in the critical professions of education and nursing, as well as business and the liberal arts. The Georgia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of Georgia's business community, over 4,000 members strong, working with lawmakers for over 90 years to make sure that our state remains a place where companies thrive. And by supporters of Georgia Public Broadcasting. Thank you. Coming up on Lawmakers, the Senate votes not to reconsider the passage of the homeowner's tax relief grant legislation. Governor Sonny Perdue tells county commissioners that now is not the time for property tax grants. And our leadership interview series continues with Senate Democratic leader Robert Brown. Those stories and more are coming up next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers. Here are your anchors and Wandy Lawson and David Zelski. Good evening, everyone. Also on tonight's broadcast, Senate Democrats say they're developing a plan to carefully consider how the state should move forward in these difficult economic times. And lawmakers Valerie Edwards takes a look at proposed tort reform legislation. But first, our top story tonight, the Senate moves forward with legislation aimed at preserving the homeowner's tax relief grant. A reconsideration vote of House Bill 143, the legislation that would preserve the homeowner's tax relief grant in times of state surplus, did not pass the Senate this morning. Senator Steve Thompson, who made the motion to reconsider last Friday, discussed why this bill needed to be reconsidered. He is followed by Senate President Pro Tem Tommy Williams, who handled the bill in the Senate and wants this passing vote to hold. This bill is not a fix. It's not even a band-aid. We've done exactly what this bill does for eight consecutive years. I know because I was the sponsor of the Senate bill. This bill does nothing that we cannot do now, but it does give a governor a chance to lower his revenue estimate to make sure he doesn't, we don't get it done for the taxpayer. And they're not stupid. These folks know. Now, I know you know it's got some constitutional problems, according to one of our fine lawyers here. What this bill really does is says we're going to fund the HTRG in 2009, and we'll fund it in future years if we have um, exponential growth in our budget and, frankly, are able to. We've consulted with Ledge Council as well as Melanie Stockwell. Um, we'll always have lawyers to disagree, but we're uh, in communication with the Ledge Council. There are no constitutional problems. So I'd encourage you to uh, vote against reconsideration. And again, the vote to reconsider failed 23 to 32. So the next step for HB 143 is Governor Purdue's desk. Well, shortly after the Senate decided not to reconsider passage of HB 143, Governor Purdue told Georgia's county commissioners that he continues to oppose the property tax grant. As I told the legislature, when we were looking at a $1.6 billion deficit, I was going to do everything I could to fund the HTRG that was appropriated in the 09 budget. As we passed the $2 billion mark and went to $2.2 billion, and I can tell you today that's probably not where we will wind up. And uh, I could simply not find the $428 million that, uh, that we, uh, we needed to put that in there. Purdue discounts the argument that counties depend on the grants, saying while the state revenues have grown at an annual per capita rate of 1.3 percent, local property and sales tax has grown by 4.9 percent. Many local governments around the state, while on one hand acting as if you'll go into bankruptcy if you don't have HTRG, are sitting on reserve accounts that exceed their entire annual operating budget. The governor also says the state cannot look to the federal stimulus package for relief. I have waited on Washington before and that was not uh, a wise decision. Uh, I personally believe it's irresponsible in a balanced budget state to propose an unbalanced budget that assumes money that may or may not materialize. 
A Senate Special Committee on Stimulus Priorities has been formed by Senate Democratic Leader Robert Brown. He says they're developing a plan to carefully consider how the state should move forward during these tough economic times. The development of the plan depends on two factors. First, using a base of knowledge about federal stimulus plans from Democratic colleagues serving in Congress. And second, meeting with state agency directors and commissioners to get a clear picture of Georgia's needs. We have been in contact with people in Washington who are talking about the stimulus package. We have some ideas about how much and what is possibly going to be coming to Georgia, but we don't have an idea about what the needs are as legislatures, as legislators. So what we are intending to do here is bring in people from the various departments that we've invited to a meeting on Friday morning at 9.30 at 341 here at the Capitol, room 341 here at the Capitol, to examine exactly what is happening to their constituents, the people that they serve. Are they increasing? Are the roles decreasing? Are they seeing more severe cases? Exactly what is happening as far as the impact on people, not only employees, not on people who have been in furlough. While we have sympathy and empathy for those people, we are indeed more concerned about the citizens of Georgia who will be impacted by this. House Democrats say that they can put $1 billion back into the state coffers by allowing local governments to collect sales tax. Representative Virgil Flood says HB 356 would relieve an understaffed State Department of Revenue. They know that, that they can hire more people and collect more revenue, but the state has a hiring freeze. So they can't hire more people, therefore they're not able to collect the dollars that, that they know is out there. And we believe that this, the local governments have a vested interest not only in collecting the money, but getting those tax revenues remitted back to them in a much more timely fashion, that instead of paying the state a 1% collection fee, they can use that 1% fee and go out and hire a private contractor to collect the money on their behalf. In addition to allowing local governments to collect sales tax, HB 356 lowers the threshold for electronic sales tax filing from $5,000 to $1,000. Clint Mueller represents the state's county commissions. They favor revising the collection structure. What we're trying to work on is some legislation that would lower the compliance gap. And it's really not fair to the legitimate businesses that are actually collecting the sales tax and remitting it to have to compete against businesses that aren't doing what's legally required of them. House Democrat leader DeBose Porter says HB 356 will go a long way towards closing the budget deficit. If we more efficiently simply collect what is owed right now, we could relieve the pressure on cuts on schools. We could replace school nurses. We could, we could do the money for national certified teachers. We could address health care and public health uh, in our local health departments. Governor Purdue is backing legislation designed to spur biotech business growth in Georgia. However, the proposal is being met with skepticism from some consumer groups. Lawmakers Valerie Edwards is live from the Capitol with those details. Valerie. David, Senate Bill 101 provides limited immunity to drug manufacturers and makers of medical devices if they are headquartered in Georgia or they employ more than 200 people. What that means is if someone dies or is injured as a result of taking a drug or using a medical device, the patient would be prohibited from filing a lawsuit against the drug company or manufacturer. SB 101 was authored by Republican State Senator Bill Calzert of Athens, who called the measure an outstanding economic development tool, one he hopes will bring much needed and high paying jobs to Georgia. Calzert is also hoping for the creation of a biotech corridor between Augusta, Atlanta and Athens, similar to North Carolina's research triangle. We're trying to send a strong message to them to come to Georgia, we will have a friendly environment for you where you will be immune from liability for claims that you are reasonably relying upon FDA approval of your products. We just want to make it clear in Georgia law that we will not have a separate cause of action against a company, that's a Georgia company, or employs 200 people or more here, if they relied in good faith on the FDA approval process and their warning and labeling requirements. Consumer advocates strongly oppose SB 101, which they say endangers those who rely upon the safety claims of the pharmaceutical industry and the efficiency of the Food and Drug Administration. Buck Rogers is legislative chair for the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association. Well, if, if an individual is harmed by a, a drug that these companies make, 
Um, now the immunity is, is premised on FDA approval. And as we've seen with the peanut butter situation, um, the FDA may not be the best uh, bureaucracy to be putting the, the safety of Georgians uh, in control of. But if a, a Georgian is harmed by a drug or a medical device, then typically they would have the opportunity to sue that company to get a remedy, to get money damages for the harm done to them. But this immunity would provide no cause of action. As I said at the beginning, SB 101 provides limited immunity. So while the measure prohibits lawsuits against the manufacturer if there are defects in the design process of a drug or medical device, what is not covered, however, are defects in the manufacturing process. So presumably a lawsuit could still be filed against a company if, for example, corroded wires were used in a pacemaker. Reporting live, I'm Valerie Edwards for Lawmakers. Okay, thanks for that report, Valerie. Well, the Senate unanimously passed three bills today, Senate Bill 24, the Probation Management Act, Senate Resolution 96, urging the board of the Georgia Military College to maintain current military programs, and Senate Bill 14, which would prohibit those on the National Sex Offender Registry from serving on a school board. Senator John Douglas explains the last bill, Senate Bill 14. May 2008, a person who has twice been in trouble with the law as a sex offender, one time with a minor, actually qualified to run for school board uh, in Newton County. And so it was only through the diligence of the newspapers and other people in that area that this fact came out. He did not tell anybody that he was uh, a convicted pedophile when he qualified to run for the school board. Georgia law makes no provision for barring somebody with that kind of background from running for a school board. Georgia law says that if you're convicted of a felony, you can run for office after a 10-year window has elapsed from your entire, the completion of your entire sentence. So what Senate Bill 14 will do is it will prevent a recurrence of that and it will stop anyone from trying to use a school board seat. Not that I think they would get very many votes, but it would stop anyone from trying to use a school board seat to get back into our schools and get around our children. Again, that bill, SB 14, passed unanimously. In other Senate news today, Senator Robert Brown took the well to explain the Democrats' Five for Fighting plan. This is a slew of five bills to be dropped this session dealing with veteran needs. Senator Emanuel Jones explains three of their initiatives. One has to do with the spouse of a wounded vet and giving that spouse of a wounded vet up to 90 days paid leave to attend to any hospitalization of recovering time for a wounded veteran. The second initiative that we started has to do with marriage counseling for struggling families dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome, but also those families that's dealing with foreclosures. The third initiative I want to talk to you about is an initiative that we call tax relief for our combat veterans. We are going to introduce some initiatives that will do away with the property taxes, property taxes for disabled vets or spouses of deceased vets. We invite you to check out GPB's online resources at gpb.org lawmakers. Find the latest from GPB's radio news team and watch Lawmakers Online. All that and more is available at gpb.org lawmakers. We invite you to visit that site and to vote in our legislative issue poll. We'll bring you the results of that poll later this week. The House today voted to continue offering airlines a sales tax break on jet fuel. Representative Mark Burkhalter presents House Bill 212. What it simply does is exempts the state sales tax on jet fuel, the first 1.8 percent of the 4 percent state sales tax on jet fuel. Our old formula we had previously capped the total amount of state sales tax for jet fuel at $15 million. This is a new formula that was put into place in conjunction with the Department of Economic Development and the governor's office to try to incentivize jobs to come to Georgia. And the net effect has been new jobs coming to Georgia. AirTran, as an example, has moved several jobs from Orlando to Atlanta because of this legislation. Macon Representative David Lucas says the state cannot currently afford to offer airlines this tax break. I would ask you to thank hard on giving a yay vote to this particular bill. Uh, I think we right now need to see about holding 30 million. HB 212 passed 132 to 31. It now moves to the Senate. 
State and federal law already requires directors and owners of daycare centers have background checks. But if House Bill 70 becomes law, all daycare employees and adults who live in homes that are also daycare centers would have their fingerprints taken for background checks. Today, the House Children and Youth Committee recommended the bill become law. Lawmakers Emily Banks joins us live with more. Emily. That's right, David. House Bill 70 would require background checks on, for instance, a spouse or adult child who lives in a home where daycare takes place. Now, the committee heard from Representative Sean Jergison last week about this bill, but waited to vote on it until today after a funding mechanism could be written into the legislation. The bill requires a line item of $270,000 be added to the state's budget, which in the current economy may not come this year. I know we're all very conscious of the uh, budget situation that we're in. Um, I think that this, this, this project or this bill was a uh, uh, carryover from last year, if you remember, and it might be carried over to next year. But, but I think it's important legislation that we need to move forward. Representative Jergison explained the importance of the bill last week. By using fingerprints, we can get an affirmative identification and uh, of the individuals of, and making sure that they are not convicted felons uh, and should not be in that type of setting. If House Bill 70 becomes law, it would go into effect once funded rather than the original effective date of June 30th, 2010. Now a similar piece of legislation passed the House last session 159 to 1 but never came to a vote in the Senate. Reporting live, I'm Emily Banks for Lawmakers. Thanks for that report, Emily. Well, on the heels of a, rate, a recent outbreak of salmonella across the nation and linked to a peanut processing plant in Georgia, the House Agriculture Committee announced today the creation of the Consumer Protection Investigation and Oversight Subcommittee. Now, its task will be to oversee the safety of agricultural products in the state. Representative Kevin Levitis rather presented the plan. We are here on the state level to ensure that all of the citizens of Georgia have confidence that the system is working the way it's supposed to, and if it's not, that we make any adjustments to it that need to be made. Among the other things we'll be looking at at the committee are the standards that are currently in place. Are those standards being met? Do we need different standards? For example, in any kind of food processing plant, is there a cleaning plan, a sanitation plan that they have, sanitizing plan that they have? Is, if so, is that filed with the Commissioner of Agriculture, and if not, that's something that we will certainly be looking closely at. Representative Levitis is the subcommittee's co-chair. He said that although the Blakely plant scandal brought the need for a committee to light, the committee will cover broader consumer product production in the state. The particular situation in Blakely, which is now apparently expanded into Texas, where they found a um, presence of salmonella in another peanut corporation plant, um, that certainly brought this to the front. But this is a much broader look at the overall uh, standards that we have in agriculture in the state of Georgia. Levitis also said that although the committee would not perform the tasks of the FDA, it will strive to raise agricultural standards in the state of Georgia. Well, teens may soon find that holding a cell phone in one hand and a steering wheel in the other is not a legal combination. Lawmakers Brittany Evans has the details. The Driver Safety and Services Subcommittee of the House Motor Vehicles Committee recently heard testimony on HB 21 and HB 23. Both bills look to ban teenage cell phone use while driving, but the specifics differ. HB 23 sponsor, Representative Matt Ramsey, explains those differences. Mine is for under 18-year-old drivers, and Representative Oliver's focuses on individuals with Class D licenses, which includes 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and I think some 21-year-olds have Class D licenses as well. The other difference is my, my penalties and fines are, 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 are more severe than hers. Although the penalties and age specifications differ, both legislators, Representative Ramsey for HB 23 and Representative Mary Margaret Oliver for HB 21, ultimately work towards the same goal. Representative Oliver explains. More and more prevalence, these wrecks do relate to the inexperienced teenage driver who is distracted by use of some mechanical device in their hands. Set a standard for our younger drivers that they cannot be driving with these things attached to their heels. Criticism of the bill has come from ham radio operators who believe both representatives should exclude ham radio users from the legislation. The committee asked both representatives for more data from studies on teen cell phone use. This discussion will continue at the committee's next meeting, which should be next week. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Brittany Evans. 
Our Lawmakers Leadership Series of interviews continues tonight with the Senate Democratic Leader Robert Brown. I had the opportunity to sit down with Senator Brown this afternoon. I began by asking him about handling the budget. We are thinking that there's a need to get deeper into the budget issue. Uh, to date, we've just focused on what is happening as far as employees are concerned. We've talked about the loss of teachers, the forlorn, the loss of nurses. I think it's important for us to understand what is, that means for constituents, the people they serve. If you don't have a nurse in the school, uh, who, uh, who will be affected? How many children will be affected? What kinds of effects will it have on those children? And I know that there's usually a, a kind of a reaction, say, well, if they can't get it at school, they can just go to the public health clinic. Well, well, in this case, this is a complete recession. I mean, it's hitting everybody. And so the public health clinic probably will not have any room at the end for them at, at the public health clinic. So we are wanting to get better grounded in the knowledge of what's going on with people that the state would serve or otherwise not be able to serve if we do not have the resources uh, to employ the people to make those services available. And we are doing this because we see it, that it's important for us to be connected to what is happening in Washington. Uh, we know that the stimulus money is coming down. We want to make sure that we are ready to have smart recovery in Georgia. We want to make sure that the money is spent in a way that directly benefits the people of Georgia, not necessarily the bureaucracy of Georgia, but going directly to the people. And we we feel that we can have the people who are on the front line tell us exactly what they anticipate and then we can burrow down even further than that in our respective communities and talk to agencies and individuals and find out more accurate knowledge and then communicate that back both to the state and to Washington. One issue uh, when it comes to where we don't have enough money, that has been transportation. Uh, there has been the TSPLOS bill that started in the Senate and the yeah. statewide transportation tax right. in the House. Right. What do you think needs to be done when it comes to transportation? I think what needs to be done when it comes to transportation is, number one, we need to have a transportation plan that meets the needs of the entire state. Now, I know that there's a regional plan that I believe would do a lot for the metro area. The penny tax that would be generated from that would go a long ways as far as congestion is concerned, but it would produce virtually nothing in Wilkerson and Twiggs, the counties that I represent. And so we have to have a more comprehensive way of looking at the structuring of the transportation plan. I know that there's one in the House that's being uh, developed uh, that may come closer to being a complete statewide plan. I don't think it fully meets the needs, but somewhere in between the two, I'm hoping that we will be able to meet uh, together and decide on a plan that meets the needs of rural Georgia as well as the congestion and other needs of urban Georgia. Education is over 60 percent of the budget and you know when it comes to you see we've seen transportation and we've seen budget issues going on but when it comes to education it's kind of been on the in the back seat uh, it seems this session but there there have been things like the voucher bill that have come up tell me your stance on the voucher bill and education in general this session sure the voucher bill I think is one of the worst bills that I've seen in education since I've been in the legislature that bill will essentially decimate the public schools I believe that it's important for us to be critical of the public schools. I don't, I don't think that the public schools are doing everything that we want them to do. And so I'm not going to sit here and defend each and every aspect of public schools, but the fa fact of the matter is we do not need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And basically what this bill would do is take funds away from public schools and place them into private schools. It will say to people, here's $5,000 that we intended for it to be for education, but you can spend it in any way for education that you want to spend it for, whether that's going to a um, madrasa or going to a uh, private school or going to one of these uh, proprietary schools that will be developed. And so that is a bad investment for Georgia money. I think what we need to do is continue to put that money into public schools and insist that public schools have a high level of performance, but it's public money. And if the private sector wants to enhance it, people in private schools, they have that right. In, in America, you know, you have that choice. But we have to direct public monies in ways that they were intended to be directed. Okay, well, thanks for your time today. Sure. Senate Democratic Leader Robert Brown, thanks sure. again. Thank you. Hundreds of volunteer advocates for abused and neglected children met with legislators at the Capitol today to bring awareness to their cause. Lawmakers Alan Friedman has that story. CASA or court-appointed special advocates for children 
is a nonprofit organization whose goal is to advocate for the safety, permanency, and well-being of neglected or abused children. Today I spoke with the executive director of the organization's Georgia chapter, Dwayne Hathaway, about their role here in Georgia. Well, CASA is a court-appointed special advocate, and uh, primarily our, our CASA volunteer is trained uh, with 30 hours of training, classroom-type training, court observation, to just really uh, understand how to talk to judges and re prepare reports about what's in the best interest of children that have been in foster care. Just minutes ago, hundreds of CASA volunteers from all across the state had their photo taken with Governor Sonny Perdue. Earlier I spoke with several of them about their personal experiences with the organization. We come into play when children have been pulled out of the home. Defects usually has custody and they're in a foster home. So we go and visit the children. Our primary concern is the safety and well-being of the children. We want to try to get them placed in permanent homes as quickly as possible. The most satisfying thing about it is getting to know the children and seeing either they're reunited with their family or in, in a placed in an adoptive home. It's, it's a little bit sad, some of the, some of the things, but um, it's, it's just very rewarding. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Alan Friedman. Minimum Wage and a Parent Protection Act were just some of the topics discussed during this year's Student Lobby Day, sponsored by the National Association of Social Workers. Lawmakers Tiana Fernandez has more. We have over 500 students from 10 colleges and universities across the state here learning how to interact effectively with their representatives and to learn about the uh, process of how a bill becomes a law. Jan Yates, president of NASW, also talked about issues that are affecting some of their current supporters. After the meeting, these supporters shared their concerns. Many years ago, there was many times that I could not get off work to go to things for my children at school. NASW feels the proposed solution to this problem that many parents face is HB 37, referred to as the Parent Protection Act. Melissa Conrad, policy and project coordinator of Georgia Stand Up, talked about the bill. We're asking for 24 hours of unpaid leave, which basically means all that the employer has to do is give someone the time off that they need to be able to go and take care of these routine medical appointments or to take care of an emergency situation. HB 290 dealing with minimum wage was also a major concern for members of NASW. Tracy Harold, a 9 to 5 Atlanta intern, explains. Increasing the wages of our workers will not only help to improve self-sufficiency for individuals and families, but it's also going to be money put back into our community. And with over 500 supporters, NASW hopes their proposed solutions are heard. Hey. Reporting hey. for Lawmakers, hey. I'm Tiana, I'm Tiana Fernandez. Fernandez from George well, coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, Senate Bill 31, the Georgia Nuclear Energy Financing Act, is scheduled to be debated on the Senate floor. Governor Perdue's bill addressing the election of local Board of Education members is expected to be heard in a Senate committee. And Valerie Edwards will have more coverage of tort reform proposals. We'll have those stories and more tomorrow night on Lawmakers at 7 p.m. If you've missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, please tune in tomorrow morning when Lawmakers repeats at 5.30 a.m. on GPB or 7 a.m on GPB Knowledge. You can also keep up with all the action under the Gold Dome daily on your local GPB radio station during Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Georgia Gazette. Coming up next here on GPB Television, Georgia Outdoors, tonight's all-new episode features animal architects. Hmm, that sounds pretty interesting. Georgia Outdoors is next here on GPB Television. And that is our broadcast for this, the 16th legislative day of the 2009 session of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm David Zelsky. And I'm in Wandy Lawson. Join us tomorrow at 7 for Lawmakers. Good night. of Georgia Public Broadcasting.